thank you for joining this pilgrimage to Pentecost. I'm Archbishop Julian Porteous from the Archdiocese of Hobart in Tasmania. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, pilgrimage. I think it's a very exciting initiative. It will be a spiritual journey. We'll be joining the disciples, if you like, as they are awaiting the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pente at Pentecost, when they will receive power from on high. As the world is going through this disturbing experience associated with the spread of the uh, coronavirus, I think this is a very important time, a very special opportunity for all of us to pause a little, to have a little bit more time for reflection, for prayer, and in a very particular way, this gives us a great opportunity of preparing for this great feast of the Church, the feast celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Apostles of Pentecost. So as we move towards the celebration of Pentecost this year, I'd like to today focus on just one aspect of the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. The way I would like to entitle it is to describe the Holy Spirit as the healer of the soul. On the evening of the resurrection, the risen Lord appeared to his disciples in the locked upper room. He greeted them with the words, peace be with you. And then perhaps to the surprise of his disciples, he began to speak to them about the forgiveness of sins. And he said to them, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Of all the things that the Lord, the risen Lord, would speak to his disciples about, why was the forgiveness of sins so uppermost in his mind? And I think to understand this, we need to look more deeply at the significance and meaning of what had just happened in the death and resurrection of the Lord. In the end, why did the Lord go to Calvary? It was so that sin might be forgiven. Jesus offered himself as the sacrificial lamb in this great act of atonement, this reconciliation of God and humanity. Humanity was redeemed, restored in its relationship with God. And the sacrifice of Christ on the cross released the forgiving mercy of God upon humanity. If you like, like a mighty flood, divine mercy now flows forth once Christ offered himself as a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. The parable that the Lord told us of the prodigal son, I think, is a very, very significant parable because it reflects the nature of the heart of God. In the heart of God lies a depth of mercy. If you like, that mercy longs to be poured forth. Because the parable describes the father as the one who waits. And one can imagine him perhaps looking down the road every day to see if today his son would return, would come back up the road. And when he does come, the Lord describes in the parable so strikingly the joy of the father, the excitement of the father, the son has finally returned and goes up and embraces him. This parable, we call it the parable of the prodigal son, but it's really a parable about the mercy that is found in the heart of the father. In the heart of God lies a depth of mercy beyond our understanding, beyond our imagining. And God wants us to experience this mercy, to receive this mercy. So appearing to his disciples at the first, for the first time after his resurrection, Jesus speaks about the forgiveness of God, speaks about the mercy that had now been released upon humanity through his own death and resurrection. And what he does then, very deliberately, if you like, the very first thing he wants to do for his disciples 
to say, I'm going to give you authority to forgive sins. So whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. This is the authority that I entrust to you. But it's also very interesting to note that St John tells us that just prior to giving the, the, the apostles this authority, we're told Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit will actually be the agent, the means by which the mercy and forgiveness of God is made effective in the life of the person who seeks it. In other words, mercy is now going to be dispensed through the church. And clearly this is what Jesus wanted to happen. <clears throat> if you like, it was the very first thing on his mind. It was the thing that he, he couldn't wait to do to sort of say, look, through my death and resurrection, I've accomplished this reconciliation between God and man. Through my death and resurrection, I've enabled the, the love and mercy of God to flow forth upon humanity. And you, you my apostles, you my disciples, you are to be the agents, the instruments, the means by which what I have accomplished on Calvary can now, made, now, now become effective in the life of people. In the sacrament of penance, the priest gives the prayer of absolution at the conclusion of the sacrament. It's worth listening to the words that the priest says. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and, and re resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit amongst us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This prayer is rich in meaning and powerful in its effects. In the prayer we see God is described as the Father of mercies. And then it announces that reconciliation of the world has been achieved through the death and resurrection of Christ. That's what St Paul taught in his second letter to the Corinthians, that, the, that Christ, that God has recon, reconciled the world to himself in Christ. Christ's whole mission was to bring about this reconciliation and he accomplished this on Calvary. But then we, we note that the prayer specifically speaks about the Holy Spirit, who is to be the, the means by which this mercy is made effective in the life of the person who approaches God in the sacrament. We're told that the Holy Spirit was sent amongst us for the forgiveness of sins. Here we're reminded of what Jesus did at the Last Supper, at the time when he made priests, but then when he came to see them after his resurrection, he gave them authority then as his priests to effect the sacrament of penance. Finally, the prayer mentions that this Forgiveness will be mediated through the church. In other words, through the ministry of the priest. As in all sacraments, there are two fundamental elements. There's the sovereign action of God, and then there is the ministry of the priest. This is the sacramental dispensation, which was ordained by Christ for his work of salvation to continue in and through the church. We all know the reality of our human condition. We know that we all have aspirations to do good. But we also, also know that we sin. This human condition, which we are very, very familiar with, is described in the Catholic Catechism in these words. Following St Paul, the Church has always taught that the overwhelming misery which oppresses men 
and their inclination towards evil and death cannot be understood apart from their connection with Adam's sin and the fact that he has transmitted to us a sin with which we are all born afflicted and a sin which is a death to the soul. Humanity had broken its relationship with God through the sin of Adam and Eve. And this continues through all subsequent sin. God's intention is to restore this relationship and to provide a means by which each person could be personally reconciled with God. This personal reconciliation is firstly achieved through the sacrament of baptism because this sacrament draws us out of our isolation from God and brings us into a relationship with him. This sacrament, again, is a work of the Holy Spirit who cleanses us from original sin and raises us up to be to have the dignity of being sons and daughters of God. The symbol of water used in the sacrament is a sign of cleansing and a sign of the new life of grace which is bestowed upon the, upon the baptised. However, the Christian life is one where each of us continue to daily struggle with temptation and sin. And it's here that God has provided a, a remedy. We can confess our sins and receive forgiveness through the sacrament of penance. The way in which we come under the grace of forgiveness is through our own heartfelt confession of sin and the expression of genuine sorrow and desire for amending our lives. It's worth remembering that Christ began his public ministry with the words, repent, for the kingdom of God is close at hand. Through his death and resurrection, the kingdom has been inaugurated and those who repent can receive forgiveness. And the church will be the instrument by which that forgiveness is dispensed through the sacrament of penance. Let's just look at the actual role that the Holy Spirit does play in the sacrament. I've already mentioned that the priest invokes the Holy Spirit in the prayer of absolution. As in baptism, it is the Holy Spirit who comes to cleanse and give new life. And this sacrament then is far more than just a legal process of being exonerated or set free from punishment. It is the action of a merciful God who purifies the soul. However, the Holy Spirit has already been active even prior to the sacramental moment. St John reminds us that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit has already been active in our conscience, assisting us to know the reality of our sin and to experience a desire to confess our sins. I think it's always very good to ask the Holy Spirit to assist us when we have time to examine our conscience. Something quite extraordinary happens though when we go to confession. We know we are forgiven. We feel fresh, new, we come out of the sacrament changed. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord said, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The soul then is purified and made white as wool. See, this is the action of grace. This is the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in the moment of absolution. In traditional Catholic terminology, we are now in the state of grace. Added to this is the restoration of our relationship with the Father, which was shown to us so wonderfully in the parable of the prodigal son. The son is drawn back into the life of the father's house. And so we are drawn back into our life in God. We often feel, don't we, a new sense of closeness with God. 
embarrassment is left behind. We know that we are fully accepted by the Father. In the story of the healing of the paralytic, told to us in chapter 2 of St Mark's Gospel, Jesus, looking at the para paralytic, says, My child, your sins are forgiven. I think this is a very interesting statement by the Lord. It's, it's as though he's saying, look, I see you're a paralytic. I see your need, need for physical healing. But there's something far more that I want to do for you. I want to heal your soul. So every time we come to confession, this healing power of Christ touches our soul. We are not only forgiven, but we are infused with the healing presence of God, again mediated through the action of the Holy Spirit. God the Father longs to pour forth his mercy upon all of humanity, but upon each of us individually through the agency and activity of the Holy Spirit. But the Father waits for us, like the Father in the parable of the prodigal son. God waits for us, ready to receive us with great joy when we come to him with a contrite heart. Now it's true, isn't it? That we can so easily become blind to the seriousness of our sins, blind to what our sins have done. We're particularly blind to what our sins really have done to the heart of the Father. We regularly dismiss their significance, making light of the damage they do. Yet sin is real, so very real. Sin is so damaging. God takes sin seriously, very seriously. So seriously that he asked his own son to offer his life as an act of atonement for humanity in its sinfulness. And now this work of Christ's atonement, this work of his death and resurrection, is now accomplished in the life of each one of us through the activity of the Holy Spirit, particularly at that moment of absolution in the sacrament of penance. So what the Lord said to his disciples on that first Easter evening, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven, is now made a reality for us. So every time that we approach the sacrament of penance, let us be aware firstly that we can receive the forgiveness through this sacrament because of what Christ has done for us on Calvary. But let us also know that at that moment of going before the Lord in the sacrament of penance, the grace of the Holy Spirit flows in upon us, healing and restoring and giving new life. Because the Holy Spirit very truly is the healer of our soul.